Hey, what's up guys, welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I wanted to show you guys a case study of how a family of four making an average salary can retire in about 10 to 15 years using what I call asymmetrical returns. Again, we'll talk more about that later in the video. So I've been making a lot of videos now about myself saving 80%, sometimes even 90% of my income, but I definitely wanna dedicate this video to someone a little bit more normal than me because 90% of your income is definitely a bit too abnormal. I'm gonna make a sample budget for a family of four. You guys can adjust these numbers according to where you live. Again, I live in Texas. So you guys might live in a different state or maybe even a different country. So feel free to adjust these numbers according to where you live. So in the first part of this video, I'm gonna go through the sample budget for the family of four. And then in the second part, I'm gonna present to you guys two different case studies. One case study is the family of four adapting to traditional teachings of maxing out their 401k. What is this family of four gonna be able to accomplish maxing out their 401k in 12 years versus a second case study, which is a contrarian family. Again, what I mean by contrarian is someone that goes against the grain, goes against sentiment. Imagine in 1999, right before the tech bubble, all your friends were virtually buying tech stocks. If you weren't buying tech stocks, you were basically considered a loser and an outcast. If you were a macro investor in the year 1999, you would have opt out of stocks and instead buy precious metals, specifically gold and silver. All right guys, so before we get started, I would definitely appreciate it if you guys give me a thumbs up below. It took me a very long time to do all my research and editing this video. And also subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I make videos on personal finance and investing, specifically macro investing. So I'm not the type of YouTuber that's gonna just pound stocks and stocks and stocks. I look at all asset classes, real estate, gold, silver, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and other altcoins. So whatever I believe is undervalued at the moment, that's the asset class that I focus on. So more of the macro investing level. Okay, let's get started with the budget for the family of four. So in this example, I'm gonna assume you have one parent working and commuting to work, making $60,000 per year. And then you have another parent that stays at home and has a virtual job. Whether that be Amazon, drop shipping, whatever online gig that person has, virtually an online gig and a stay at home gig. So all together, this couple makes $90,000 per year as a couple with two kids. So I'll base my budget out of that. So let's get started with the budget. So I'm gonna start off with accommodation. So for accommodation, I'm gonna assume that family of four definitely wants a two bedroom apartment, one bedroom for the couple, another bedroom for the two, two little kids to share. So for that family, I'm gonna say rent of about $1,000. Again, if you guys live in the city, it's very hard to find rent for $1,000. So this budget is built for someone that lives in a suburb. Again, especially with this COVID stuff, a lot of people are working from home now. So working from home is becoming a little bit more common, especially with COVID. So hopefully as we progress through the years going into 2021, 2022, more and more work from home jobs are possible. So we can save on gas money and rent, especially living in a suburb. So we can definitely accomplish those kind of things. So for rent, I'm gonna say $1,000 for that family. For internet, I'm gonna say $100. For cell phone bill, I'm gonna say $150 for that family of four. Again, you have two kids that are probably little, so they probably don't need a phone at the moment. When I was a kid, I didn't get my first phone until I was in high school. Okay, next we have renter's insurance for about 20 bucks. So now we have water and electricity for $300. I'm gonna assume that dad who has to commute to work doesn't have a car from college, so he has to buy a car. Definitely buy a used car, especially if you're gonna retire in 10 years anyway, 12 years. So what, what's the point of buying a brand new car? So for that example, I'm gonna say $150 for the used car payment and $150 for the full coverage car insurance. So for a total of $300 for car insurance and car payment. Next is gas. I'm gonna assume gas payment of about $100. Next is food. Again, it's a family of four. I'm gonna need to make a pretty big food budget, especially if the kids are very little and needs diapers and things like that. So I'm going to put an $800 budget for food and whatever the kids might need. Next we'll have miscellaneous. So whatever you guys might need, toiletries, whatever random items you might need, maybe emergency bills. I'm going to say $200 for all of that. Next we have fun and eating out. So I kind of lumped this category together because you know it's definitely not a, a high budget, especially for a family of four. But you know, for me, honestly, 
a simple taco from the taco stand or a simple meal from a mom and pop shop were 10 or $15. That's good enough for me once a week. I don't need to eat out daily every day or six times during the weekend. So I believe if you guys are minimalist and have the ambition to retire early, I believe this budget should work out even for the family of four. So I'm gonna say $200 for fun or eating out. Okay, next we have saving. Again, even though for me, I am very aggressive into investing, I definitely believe that you guys should have have an emergency fund. So I'm gonna say in year zero, you guys have nothing. In the first year at least, have $500 a month allocated into savings. All right, next we're gonna have student loan payments. So I'm gonna assume that this family still has student loans all the way from college that haven't been paid off. Again, not financial advice. I personally recommend that the family makes minimum payments on a student loan. Again, the average payment for student loans is $150. So let's say for the couple altogether, student loan payments will cost roughly $300 a month. There's been a lot of arguments whether you should pay off your student loans or invest. For me, in my personal opinion, especially if you're maxing out your 401k or buying something that has greater returns, a 4% student loan interest versus a maxed out 401k, it's no comparison. I'm definitely gonna pay the minimum on my student loan. Altogether, minus the savings, the total expenditures for that family of four is $3,450. If you include the savings, it's $3,950, but we'll go ahead and round it out to $4,000 of expenditures, including the $500 a month in saving. So let's go back to the example of the family, the couple making $90,000 per year, minus all the healthcare deductions, minus all the dental deductions. I'm gonna say the $90,000 per year of total income is gonna produce $6,000 a month between the couple. So maybe the dad takes home 4,000 and the mom takes home 2,000. So together, the couple takes home $6,000 a month. Again, I haven't factored in the 401k just yet. I'll talk about that later on. So altogether, $6,000 of revenue or income and then four thousand dollars of expenses that gives us a total disposable income of roughly two thousand dollars per month so this family should feel comfortable investing twenty four thousand dollars per year especially they're so young i'm gonna assume this family is in their 20s so especially I, i've already factored in the five hundred dollars a month into savings so i believe if you're young if you're in your 20s twenty four thousand dollars a year going all out should be definitely what you should do again not financial advice but if that was me in my 20s twenty four thousand dollars a year you should definitely go for it so now let's look at the case studies. I made two case studies. Like I said previously, one case study is the family maxing out their 401k. And then the second case study is a family opting out of the 401k and instead buying precious metals like silver. Again, I'm not telling you guys what to do. Definitely do your research, but I hope you guys can learn something from this case study because this case study is what I would call macro investing, which is buying what you think is undervalued. You know, don't just be so ingrained about, oh, the S&P 500 returned 7% historically year over year you know really do your own research be a little bit more sophisticated when you guys invest because don't just rely on data that the s p 500 makes seven percent returns every year definitely do your own research and really look into that why has the s p 500 returned seven percent look into the charts again you don't need an economics degree to figure this out you know just do a little bit of research watch youtube videos like mine watch other people's youtube videos a lot of smart people out there are talking about this kind of stuff so this is what i would call macro investing which is looking into asset classes that you believe is undervalued. Basically in 2008, for example, you had the real estate bubble. So it wasn't until 2011 that real estate became undervalued. So that was the best time to buy real estate. So in this case study, I'm gonna show you guys an example of the family deciding to go all in into silver because he believes silver is undervalued in comparison to stock. Now the case study was built for someone that lives in the year 2000. Again, someone that makes $90,000 a year in 2020. It's not gonna make $90,000 a year in 2000 adjusted for inflation. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna keep it the same just so I can keep my example from above. So right now, according to the IRS website in 2020, because of all the COVID stuff, they've increased the maximum contribution to, to your 401k to 19,500. So for the sake of this example, I'm going to use that 19,500 number. And we'll say that the employer matches your contribution of 90,500. Altogether, you're putting in $39,000 annually towards your 401k, which is completely maxed out. Also, in this example, we're going to use the S&P 500 average annualized return, not adjusted for inflation between the year 2000 and the year 2011. So between those two time periods, the S&P 500 produced 0.667% annualized return. So not even one 
1%. But again, this is only for the sake of my case today. I just want to show you guys something and prove a point. But we definitely have the luxury of the 401k match where the employer matches your contribution. So let's see how well that match produces in terms of extrapolating this example. So at a 0.667% growth rate annualized every year in a portfolio invested completely in the S&P 500 index with a 100% employer contributions where you invest 19,500, the employer matches that. So altogether, you're investing $39,000 annually. So in 12 years, that portfolio will yield a total portfolio balance of $488,000. It's pretty impressive actually at first glance, considering in 12 years, you've almost doubled your money. Now remember from my previous example, you had disposable income of $2,000 per month, which is $24,000 per year. But because of the IRS rules of you only being able to contribute $19,500, you still had $4,500 of disposable income left. Well, for the sake of this case study, I'm going to assume that they had Robin Hood or M1 Finance back in the day. So instead, this couple invested their extra $4,500 of disposable income into Robin Hood and M1 Finance. Again, at the same rate of 0.667% annualized per year, that Robin Hood portfolio would produce $56,000 in 12 years. So altogether, guys, if you add your 401k portfolio from your employer plus your Robin Hood account, that total portfolio value would be $545,000 at the end of the 12 years. So even if the S&P 500 only produced 0.667% annualized returns every year, that annualized return, linear annualized return for that portfolio is 7% annually per year because of the employer match. Okay, so let's bring in the concept of macro investing into the mix. Now, macro investing might sound a little bit too sophisticated or complicated, but it's actually a pretty simple concept. Macro investing is basically, in my definition, if I were to put this into context, it's just buying something that you guys truly believe is undervalued based on economic factors and based on sentiment. So back in the year 2000, stocks were, tech stocks were overvalued. So as a macro investor, you would see that. You would see the price to earnings ratios of this stock way too overvalued. So if you were to make a thesis, your thesis would be stocks are just extremely overvalued and you don't see yourself investing in the stocks. So instead you decide to put all your money into precious metals because back in the day, as a macro investor, you definitely saw significant undervaluations in the gold and silver asset class. Now, the first chart I want to show you guys here is the Dow gold ratio. Now, for any of you guys that are watching that are gold and silver bugs out there, you guys are definitely familiar with this Dow gold ratio chart. So what this ratio tells us is how much of the Dow Jones index can you buy with one ounce of gold? So looking at the chart, if you see a Dow gold ratio, which is extremely low, so at the bottom of the chart, that tells you that stocks are undervalued and gold is overvalued. So in that case, you would be buying stocks and dumping your gold. So whenever the chart is extremely high, like at the very top, that tells you that stocks are overvalued and that you should be dumping stocks and instead putting your money into precious metals like gold. So in this chart, we, we see a Dow gold ratio at its all time high. So as a macro investor in the year 2000, you would have the thesis that you should be dumping your stocks and buying gold instead. But in this example, instead of buying gold, I'm gonna make a case study where that person buys silver instead of gold. I'm not gonna get into the complexities of why I pick silver versus gold. Gold is definitely much more stable, but for just for the sake of simplicity, Silver is basically a much more volatile asset class compared to gold. So whenever gold goes up in price, silver goes up faster. And whenever gold goes down in price, silver goes down faster and harder. So if you believe gold is going to go up in price, then as a, as a macro investor, you would also have the thesis that silver is extremely undervalued. So if gold is going to go up in price, silver is going to go up 3x, 2x of gold. So this chart right here shows you the average closing price of silver between the year 2000 and 2011. Again, I'm just showing you the closing price, meaning throughout the year, the price might have been higher or might have been lower, but this closing price is just the average. Again, another caveat is if you're going to buy precious metals, especially for those of you guys that are silver bugs out there watching this, you guys know that you guys are paying premiums for buying metal. So for example, if the price of silver is $5, you're not going to buy a piece of silver for five bucks. You're like, you might pay six bucks or maybe even seven bucks. So especially right Right now, after COVID, the premiums on silver is extremely high. So sometimes $2, $3 over spot. But under normal conditions, you typically can buy silver at about a dollar over spot. So in this example, I'm going to make the assumption that the retail investor buys silver at about a dollar over spot and sells it at spot price. 
So after 12 years of just maxing out your investments into silver and again, not putting any money at all in your 401k, after 12 years, you would have a total of 31,202 ounces of silver. After 12 years, you would have to buy storage for your silver because there's no way you're gonna keep 31,000 ounces of silver in your house. That's a lot of silver, guys. Very risky, especially if you're maxing out your investments into one asset class. So in the year 2011, the average spot price for silver was around $35. Actually, the all-time high of silver in 2011 was $50. But for the sake of this example and to keep it conservative, I'm, I'm just gonna say $35 was the average closing price. And we're gonna use that as an example. So in 2011, your 31,202 ounces of silver would be equivalent to a million dollars, 99,000. So let's take a moment to actually compare the two guys. So one example, you have someone that maxed out their 401k during the dot-com bubble. That person had a total portfolio balance of about $550,000. And then you have a second person that maxed out silver and, and put in zero dollars towards their 401k. This person had a million ninety nine thousand dollars to basically double. So think about that guys. So even with all this talks of, yeah, the S&P 500 returned 7% per year, but that is mainly because of an activity between 2011 and 2019. So 2011 to 2019 is the reason why the S&P 500 returned 7% per year because it's inflating the average. So I just wanna conclude this video, guys. Again, this video is, is a little bit of a contrarian type of point of view. I don't mean to make this video to sway you guys' opinions on stocks or gold or silver. The only point I'm trying to make is definitely be a little bit more of a sophisticated investor. Back in the year 2000, if you wanted to learn about investing, you had to read very, very thick books like this, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, which by the way, I, I recommend. But now we're in the year 2020. You guys don't have to read books like this anymore if you don't want to. You guys can watch channels like mine, watch other YouTubers, watch podcasts, listen to audiobooks. We're definitely in a much more advanced society in the year 2020 where information comes fast and free. So definitely with all this free information we have online, again, a lot of spams and fake content out there, but all in all, we have so much free content out there, so much free educational content. So do your own research, especially when you're commuting one hour to work, one hour back. So that's two hours of commuting. Spend those two hours really studying about investing and macro investing because don't just follow the crowd. You know, just because CNBC told you to invest in Amazon, don't just buy Amazon because CNBC told you so or some YouTuber told you to buy Amazon stock. Imagine if I was a YouTuber, right? And Amazon basically quadrupled in price. Let's just throw out a random number. Let's say Amazon went from $1,000 to $4,000, right? So I'm basically a YouTuber. I'm very excited because I, I 4 x my portfolio. Oh yeah, Amazon 4 x in price. So as a YouTuber, I would be excited and basically telling you guys to buy Amazon. But as a macro investor, especially when I see the PE ratios, the price to earnings ratios of Amazon being extremely overvalued, why am I gonna tell you to buy a stock that already 4 x What are the chances that that stock is gonna 4 x again or even 2 x Can you imagine Imagine Amazon going from 1,000 to 4,000 and then later going from 4,000 to 8,000. That's going to be extremely improbable, especially if the stock already inflated to all time highs and quadrupled. It's going to be highly improbable. It could, especially with the Fed printing a lot of money. So what I would recommend to you guys is definitely get into the role of macro investing. Don't just buy stocks because everyone is buying stocks because it feels so sexy. Don't just buy real estate because everyone's buying real estate and it feels sexy. Definitely be open minded. Whatever asset classes you think are undervalued, like whether that be gold or silver or real estate or stocks or bonds. Again, in the quotes of Warren Buffett, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. So when no one is buying the asset class, so let's say gold, right? No one buys gold nowadays. No one buys gold, especially millennials. Bitcoin, no one's buying Bitcoin nowadays. When no one is buying the asset class and you believe after doing all your research, you've spent hours after hours reading and watching podcasts, you believe that that asset class has a value, gold has a value, Bitcoin has value. So if you believe something has value, then definitely go for it. Buy something against the sentiment. Right now, the sentiment is all about stocks. CNBC, Fox News, they only preach stocks. They don't preach gold or Bitcoin or stuff like that. So again, thank you guys for watching this video and staying till the very end. I have different links down in my description box below. I have Weeble where you get two free stocks valued between $10 and $1,000. And then I also have Robinhood where you get a free stock just for signing up. So thank you guys again for watching and I'll see you guys at the next content.